All right. Good evening and welcome to the Anaheim Elementary School District August 19th board meeting. I am AASD Board President Paulo McAllis and I call this meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. This meeting is being conducted telephonically by means of live video broadcast on our Anaheim Elementary YouTube channel for members of the public. Board members and cabinet members will be video conferencing together to assist in managing the logistics of the meeting. For English, you may connect by phone as follows by calling 440-754-0270. When asked, please type in the PIN 724-923-684 followed by the pound sign. Spanish interpretation of the board meeting is available to attendees. Para Español, puede conectarse por teléfono de la siguiente manera. Llame al 2607-5800. Cuando se le pida, presione en el, el, el PIN 8510-5800. Symbolo pound. Now, board members tonight, as you know, uh, tonight all voting will be uh, by roll call vote. Uh, when motioning or seconding an item, please state your name. For any items being discussed, please state your name before discussing the item. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and move on to item 3A. All right. Please put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Moving on to item 3B, introductions and roll call. First up, we have board member Ryan A. Ruelas. Hello, everyone. Next, we have board member Jackie Philbeck. Good evening, everyone. Followed by board member Mark A. Lopez. Good evening. Followed by board clerk Juan G. Alvarez. Hello. I'm your board president, Paulo McAllis. Followed by our superintendent, Dr. Christopher Downing. Good evening, everyone. Followed by our assistant superintendent of Ed Services, Dr. Mary Grace. Hi. Followed by our Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, Dina Mellon. Good evening. Next is our Assistant Superintendent of Administrative Services, Michael Kraus. Good evening, everyone. Our Director of Communications and Public Information Officer, Elsa Kovribas, is not with us tonight. Following uh, her is Senior Administrative Assistant, Iris Camacho. Hello, everybody. Hey, Iris. Followed by our interpreters, Mary Madrigal, Alina Rogue. We also have our technology assistants, Janice Cato and Darren Brown. Hi, Janice Cato here. Uh, Darren is not at the meeting tonight. Oh, thank you so much for letting us know, Janice, and welcome. Okay. Moving on to I you're welcome. <laughs> Moving on to item 3C, report of closed session actions taken. Report of closed session actions taken. In closed session, the Board of Education voted unanimous, unanimously to approve an agreement with a certificated employee in consideration of the employee's resignation effective February 19, 2021, and release of all claims. The employee will receive his her benefit, her health benefit, his his or her health benefits through February 28th, 2021, and remain in paid status through his or her date of resignation. Moving on to 3D, the adoption of the agenda. Can I get a motion? So moved, Alvarez. So moved by Trustee Alvarez. Can I get a second? Second, Ruelas. Seconded by Trustee Ruelas. Discussion. Hearing none, board roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas? Aye. Trustee Philbuck. Uh, Aye. 
Aye. Trustee Mark Lopez. Aye. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I vote aye. Passes 5-0. Moving on to four. A special order of business there is none. Let's go ahead and move on to five. News and updates. Parent leadership group updates. There are no parent leadership group updates for tonight. Moving on to 5B. 5B association updates. There are also no association updates for tonight. Moving on to C. District news and updates. There are no news and updates for tonight. All right. So moving on to six, public speakers on the agenda or non-agenda items. These will be read by our superintendent, Dr. Christopher Downing, our superintendent. Thank you, Dr. McCollis. We have one public comment that was submitted. Okay. Hello, my name is Rosa Bond, and I am a parent and community leader at Orange Grove Elementary. I am interested in how to increase parent participation in the process of planning the learning continuity plan. As a member of Anaheim Intersections, a coalition made up of students, parents, community members, and nonprofit organizations from the city of Anaheim seeking to confront institutional racism or any other form of discrimination. We have spent time discussing parents and students' priorities and concerns in light of the shifts in education due to COVID-19 and would like to see them reflected in this plan as they are crucial to advancing a more equitable education. Some of these priorities include having proper technology support for parents and students, understanding that kids have different learning styles, and having more diverse communication methods between schools and families. I am interested in knowing more about the dates and times in which the district will be open to having parent engagement as part of the process to help advance AESD's mission and vision towards equity. Thank you. And that concludes right. the comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Downing. All right, moving on to seven, superintendent's report and public hearings. Uh, and by the way, everyone, presentations will be posted on the district website on the Board of Education page starting tomorrow. Moving on to A, AESD dual language immersion update. Maria Villegas, Director of Curriculum and Instruction. Uh, Magali Rodriguez, Curriculum Specialist of Dual Language Immersion. Welcome. Well, thank you so much. Good evening, um, Anaheim Elementary School Board, uh, President McCullough, Superintendent Downing, and also um, Cabinet and our community members. I am hopefully, um, I'm. my name is Maria Villegas. I'm the Director of Curriculum Instruction, and I'm joined tonight by my co-partner here, Magali Rodriguez. She's going to be navigating and presenting um, the presentation for us. So she got it all up. So we're excited to be able to join you tonight to give you an update of just um, our ongoing growth, some of our professional learning, and then some of our recently acquired uh, digital curriculum resources that we think are just going to be wonderful to support our teaching staff. So with that said, we'll go ahead and get started. So we have a first slide and it's an animated slide and it's gonna walk us through our, our history here in Anaheim with the growth of our dual language program that started in 2006. We have the three original coming up here with Price, Juarez and Lincoln. You know, they they started all for us. Um, so they have a TK6 program followed by a few other schools the last couple of years, Ponderosa, Ross, and uh, what's that last one, MAN, which is a TK4, I mean, a K4 program and a TK3 program. And then we have our most recent, not most recent, because we'll get those uh, in our final little pop-up, but you have Stoddard or Orange Grove the last couple of years with the K2 program, Orange Grove with the TK1 program. And finally, we also have acquired our Korean deal language program through Jefferson with the K1 program now. And now it's, yes, the big bubble, um, which we have 14 of our newly, um, not newly, now they're in their second year, they're getting quite experienced, two years under their belt, went into our second year, about 14 of our elementary schools uh, matric matriculating up. Here we wanted to just showcase our, our overall growth with students. As you can see, we've added 22 classrooms, giving us now a total of about 2,400 students in our dual language program. And as you can see from the graph, the majority of our friends here, our little scholars are in K and first. 
um, which is just exciting to know what that's going to look like a few years down the road. Um, as we know that this is the best pathway for, for both our EOs um, and our emergent bilinguals to really have access to, to success in the future. So here you have two slides, the top one on the left. We also wanted to just highlight there are the number of teachers. Overall, we have about 99 DLI teachers now. Again, the majority of those mirror the number of students which are in K first. Um, and then you have you know, a range between six and 10 teachers in the other grade levels. And then the graph to the right, um, on the bottom right, just showcases within those 99 teachers, how many of those teachers are new. So again, we have a total of about 28 new teachers joining us this year, whether they were from our, ex whether they transitioned into the DLI program or they're from outside of our district, we have 28 of them. Again, the majority of those, no surprise there, they're in first grade. A few trickled in there in some of the other grades in third, three of them all the way up to fifth with two, and then in our TK, another two there. And then finally, to round out our staff in our dual language program, we have our instructional assistants. Currently, we have about 36 dual language instructional assistants. Their primary task is to support the acquisition of the partner language. Um, whether that for in our case, that'd be Spanish or Korean. We want to, again, ensure that they're supporting um, the teacher and students, most importantly, with that acquisition. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Magali, which she's going to highlight, again, some of the great professional learning we've recently provided for our new teachers. Um, she's also going to highlight some of the curriculum, again, that we've been able to acquire and um, Hope that it's helpful and, and really being able to give you a good perspective of where we are in our dual language program. Go ahead, Magali, take it away. Thank you, thank you, Maria. Good, good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be here with you tonight. So here we're gonna um, kick off my, my portion of the presentation um, referring to professional development. So our primary role continues to be working with teachers, supporting teachers, because that, that generates direct impact to our students. So we're going to highlight a, um, three things here, one of them being our new DLI teacher workshop. It is our fifth year now that we're offering this workshop specifically geared to supporting teachers, whether they're transitioning into the DLI program or they um, are new to us. Um, whether uh, we had this year, we actually have quite a few teachers that have um, left their district, their current district, their seasoned teachers that have come to us because, you know, we're amazing, in case you haven't heard. Um, so we have our iStation digital platform as well. And I'm gonna get into a little bit further detail further along in the presentation as far as iStation. Um, and we have this Google Español so that it, it's coming along um, or the, the PD is forthcoming because we have been working in partnership with them. Um, in order to develop their platform, which they call a super site. And that actually offers um, digital access to our students, to all of the Descubre students who use Descubre. Um, and that's now been launched. So we're very excited about that, um, being partners with them in that. And this is not an exhausted list. We actually have added two PDs since creating the presentation today. As a follow-up to our DLI workshop, we're also going to be providing a benchmark specific PD that's going to help teachers catapult and maximize, um, especially during distance learning, the potential of the platform for students, as well as a follow up to the iStation, really focusing in on those different elements that iStation provides. So speaking of iStation, um, here we have a breakdown of what iStation is and how it functions. So it is a student-led animated game like. It's, a, it's an educational platform, but if you really think of it, iStation is the academic portion in helping students um, progress through the language. Um, it really focuses on starting the way that um, Spanish is acquired, which starts with sonidos iniciales, las sílabas, palabras, oraciones, and eventually you get into reading and writing. Um, and navigates through and it's um, student led in the sense that it adjusts to the student's proficiency level. And what that does, it allows teachers to then have reports um, to then hone in on small group instruction, collaborative instruction. So it's very tailored to the student need. Um, and then administrators are also able to um, easily monitor progress within the classroom. And then of course, teachers are able to monitor progress of students and provide that feedback that's of utmost importance and create those flexible groupings. So now if we move over to the right side where you look at Rosetta Stone. So again, iStation is more of like the, the academic 
portion of um, Spanish language arts, if you will, whereas Rosetta Stone's foundation is focusing on the language development of, of um, the specific student progress. So here we look at um, English, Spanish, and Korean, and it's e-learning. And again, it's also student-led in the sense that it adjusts to the student's level. And that's very important because as we just heard, um, it, students learn differently at different paces and they need different support in different areas. So this allows that um, to be available for students. And it includes sequence activities um, according to the proficiency level and pacing of the student. So it's not, it's pacing according to how quickly or slowly the student is moving through the program. And here we have Descubre el Español. So Descubre has actually been around for quite some time, but they recently sold the company. So why Descubre is so important is it's Spanish language development. So most of us are familiar with English language development or ELD, but there's also that component of Spanish language development. So here we look at how Spanish works. So it's not teaching in Spanish, it's teaching Spanish, how the functionality works, how the language is acquired. So it's explicit instruction of how that works. And um, again, since the acquisition of the new of the new ownership of the company, they have been working with us um, beginning of last year um, to work on, on what they call now a super site. So what that does is it allows an online digital platform for students. And it's of utmost importance now because students are now able to um, catapult or jump into this platform. And the biggest thing that got me super excited, super site, um, is that they're able to now chat with each other. So we know that part of that language is actually practicing it and speaking it and utilizing it. So this allows this, this program or this platform allows for that to happen. So they have just recently launched, they've been really working hard to get that um, forthcoming. And now we have acquired the licenses. So we're moving forward on the on the technology and uh, the back end to ensure that the students have access to that. So that's Descubre el Español. And now on our Korean um, curriculum, we know that um, there's nothing that you could buy off the shelf in terms of Korean curriculum. Everything has been created. And this is really exciting because we've been able to partner with a Korean, we called it, we coined it as a curriculum or Korean curriculum development team. And it's composed of, uh, there's six um, team members and some of them which actually live in Korea, the so one of them being an editor specifically in Korea. And why that's been very, very important to us is that there's a, there's a three pillars when it comes to bilingual education or dual language immersion education, and one of them being the cultural piece of it, right? It, it doesn't live in isolation. Language does not live in isolation. So um, we were very explicit in ensuring that whatever was developed was actually culturally sensitive and authentic, meaning the characters that you see in the books and the text, everything, they're actually famous characters in Korea, bringing that um, into the classroom for our students. So we continue to work and monitor the progress. So once we obtain uh, materials and curriculum, then it goes through a thorough vetting process within our department to ensure that it's meeting California state standards, although it's created with the, with the, with the lens of Korean language. Um, and math curriculum has also been trans adapted. So it's not just the mere um, trans adaptation is not just translating it, but it's actually, again, looking at through that lens of authentic language and um, culture. And then it's been printed for, for students and it's also available during this time digitally as well. Okay, um, we're gonna transition into speaking about the pathway to the Seal of Biliteracy Award. Um, and we this, we offer the pathway, the seal, the state seal of biliteracy. It is a seal that goes on a student's diploma that they can earn by the end of 12th grade. But the purpose of the pathway, and it's aligned with Orange County Department of Education, is to promote um, that student learning for them to continue their journey in bilingual education through junior high and through high school. And so it's important to note that it is not just the sixth grade award, if you will. This is really honoring their entire journey that begins in either TK or kinder. So every educator, kinder, first, second, third, and so on, has their piece of the pie, as I like to think about it, right? It's all part of it in order to ensure that by the time that they get to sixth grade, those skills are being developed. So for example, um, if I may, I'm gonna move on to the criteria. One of the aspects here is um, them presenting, an oral presentation in Spanish. Well, they can't just get up one day in sixth grade and I'm gonna give an oral presentation in Spanish. This is a, something that has been developed beginning in kinder. So it's a, a rubric that we have developed um, kinder or TK through sixth grade um, and every aspect they're learning something that eventually will give them success in that 
oral presentation in Spanish, if you will. So we are living in a COVID-19 era, and so we needed to be responsive and adaptive to the criteria. And um, we actually modified the criteria or looked at best way or to approach the criteria last year. And one of the elements, um, if you look at it, it's broken down into soft skills of language application. They have to be able to utilize the language. And at the top, you see here, we have the academic proficiency level of students in both English and in Spanish. And once we get um, further along, it will also be um, applied to Korean as well. Um, so we have here Las Links Español, which is a language acquisition. Um, and then you have the academic. So it's both academic and language based. And if you see the bold here, um, last year and years prior, this used to be um, the SBAC or the CSA, which is the Spanish, the California Spanish assessment. And those mirror each other in opposite languages. And so last year, our students did not um, take the, the love, the, those assessments because of the dismissal. So we only felt it was right to bring in another option for students. So they meaning they have two um, ways that they can obtain the, the, the pathway, if you will. So um, we're really trying to keep it steady and ensure that they have access to this award. Um, accelerated Reader, as you can see, and then at the bottom, you'll notice one of the soft skills um, is community service. And due to Stay Home California guidelines, we are omitting this criteria for this school year. Because even if we went back to brick and mortar, we don't know what it's going to be like. So that's just something that we felt at this time, it only made sense to eliminate it for this school year and still allow students to have that opportunity to obtain the pathway to the Seal of Literacy Award. Okay, um, now, so how many of our students earned the Pathway Award? So last year we see here, we've incremented, and I just I'd like to highlight with the specific graph that we had less classes, right? We started with one class of sixth grade, and as we matriculated through, um, as you saw in the very first slide, as we added more schools and they matriculated through, we obviously have more sixth grade classes. So we started with one sixth grade class, now we have six sixth grade classes, and last year, 2020, 94 of our students earned the Pathway to the Seal of Biliteracy Award. So it's happy news. So you can see the numbers have definitely increased. Okay, and um, some a little bit of you know happy news, if you will. Um, Californians together. I'm not sure if you're aware, but Californians together um, highlighted or really looked at Anaheim Elementary School District as leaders in just the education in general when it comes to bilingual education. But they really took some time and met with us to look at what it is that we were doing in order to share that with all other districts surrounding both um, within our state and not nationally. Um, and they were really just amazed and in awe and how responsive we were and how prepared we were to tackle um, distance learning with our students. So this is just a clip or a snapshot, if you will, of that post that they created or the, the, the um, blog and so forth. So we don't really proud of that. Okay, speaking of Californians Together, <laughs> um, as you know, Californians Together are champions, not only for the success of English learners, but they've really been the force behind bilingual education um, in terms of what's happening in California. So last year, um, in 2020, we were the recipients of the Lynn Aoki Multiple Pathway to Biliteracy District Recognition Award. And so this was a award that was um, in existence years ago. They have revamped it, they renamed it, and we were the very first ones that they thought of in terms of who was um, deserving of this, uh, the, this honor. And so the goal of the award is to inspire the development of strong dual language programs, multiple opportunities and comprehensive pathways, enabling all students to reach the goal of high levels of proficiency in two or more languages. So that's definitely something we do in and out, but it is really nice to um, get an award for it, right? So thank you to all of you. I know you've been um, drivers behind this and, and always supporting us to ensure that we have the best possible program that we can offer. Thank you. Wonderful presentation, Magali. Uh, Maria Villegas, board members at this time, do we have any questions? Thank you, Trustee Alvarez. Uh, thank you, Magali and Maria. Um, yeah, I, uh, in looking at the numbers for the amount of teachers we have currently, that's the number is 99 or 94. Um, and we have 36 aides. Um, I'm a little concerned with the amount of aides that are being uh, 
uh, provided for our teachers. So it seems like maybe there's uh, about one or one one aid for every two or three teachers. And that seems concerning. Teachers do need a lot of support with assessments and small group instruction. So I'm, I'm wondering if um, if there's a plan for maybe uh, repurposing other employees to make them uh, aids, or is there a plan to hire more aids to support the teachers in in uh, that realm? Currently, I'll just add that our, our you are um, the number. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Grace. Chris, go ahead. All right. Uh, yes, we support our TK through second grade uh, DLI teachers with the uh, aids. We also have bilingual testing assistants who provide support for our, our uh, students. Uh, at this point in time, uh, due to the COVID-19, uh, we are analyzing, again, all of our staff and look forward to presenting to the board any plans to expand the number of bilingual uh, DLI aides as necessary. Also, something that is exciting, um, in previous years, we would uh, load the classrooms in kindergarten with 32 students. And um, we felt like that wasn't equitable. So we reduced the class sizes in our dual language program to be the same as our um, non-DLI program. So that's one of the reasons um, there will be fewer IAs is that the classes, the class sizes are fewer at this point. Um, but we make sure that the um, IAs have training and that the principals know and understand how they're there to support the acquisition of language. Sure, yeah, my concern is, yeah, even though the numbers are lower, that's given, um, the pl the amount of planning that it takes to do everything now in distance learning is exponential. And so I'm concerned that we're going to uh, overload our dual language teachers with so much that they won't be able to properly assess uh, their students and move them forward. So if you can look into that, that would be great. Thank you so much. We will, Board Member Alvarez. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Alvarez. And I do have a question since we're talking about staffing. Uh, with regards to DLI, uh, I was fortunate before COVID to see some of the amazing programs uh, that we had put in place uh, with partnership with California State University Fullerton. Uh, do we see another possible cohort coming in for the teachers within our district that are already interested in teaching DLI for the following year? Go ahead, Magali. <laughs> Yes, we did receive um, great news. I think you're referring to the Become Projects. I know you um, you stopped yep. in. And, um, so we were notified that it's very quite possible that we will be granted another year of the Become Project extending it. So that's very unusual nice. especially with all the moving budgets and so forth due to COVID. Right. But um, it's forthcoming as far as we know. We have asked. Um, we don't have any hard dates yet. But if that is the okay. case, we already signed up and said, yes, we will do it. So. Please keep us updated. Very exciting. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, any other board members have any questions? Okay, Trustee Philbeck, yeah. and then we'll go to Ryan Ruelas. Uh, just a uh, thank you, first of all, Magali and Maria, for such a great presentation. Very much appreciated. And maybe just this is just a, a little point of clarification or explanation, if you can give it to me, um, because uh, this was three or four months ago, but I was asked by a few of the schools that were under the impression or told that if they, they were recruiting and they were told if they reached a certain number that they would have additional classes added. Is that even uh, relevant for this school year now? Or if you could clarify a little bit um, what the answer to them would be? Um, I'll address that one, board member Phil Gregg. Yeah, in the cases where uh, the number of students and we confirmed with the families their actual enrollment exceeded our class sizes, we did add additional teachers to support the students. Thank you. All right, Trustee Ruelas. Hi, Magali, great presentation, fantastic. Uh, lots of great stuff there. Um, you know, the one thing I do wanna ask is, and Dr. Grace mentioned it in regards to our lower class sizes, which is something that we should all really pride ourselves in, uh, that's great stuff. Uh, the question that I have is, 
in regards to our current numbers, um, how are we doing? And how does that compare to our regular years when we're not doing this through distance learning, et cetera? Have we seen a stark like decline? Is it remaining steady? What are we seeing? And is it having an impact on the other class settings with their class sizes? A non-DLI. <laughs> Um, I'll address that one. So um, as you're aware, uh, this year, uh, we've also added a 24th school, the uh, Anaheim Elementary Online Academy. Uh, at this point in time, we have had a decline in enrollment, uh, as have all districts uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, one of the things that we've put in place this year, uh, more so than ever, I think, is just uh, following up. Um, our schools were calling families um, the first hour if they if the child hadn't uh, logged in online. So we're in the process of looking at our enrollment. Uh, there is a slight decline, but our our numbers remain uh, strong, especially in our DLI programs. We haven't seen it necessarily negatively impact our non-DLI uh, classrooms, um, but. As a district, we are experiencing the same kind of decline that all districts are. Um, what we are proud of is with the online academy, we are competitive with some of the charters that might provide that um, kind of support. And our parents and families have an option now. So if you choose not to have your child, uh, when we do return to in-person, participate in in-person, we will have an ongoing virtual academy available for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Downing. Board members, do we have any other questions? Yes, I do. I have one. Uh, OK. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Magali, for the um, presentation. Very comprehensive. Um, I've been told my video is a little choppy, so I'll try to make this concise. Um, you mentioned something about the PD opportunities we've been offering. Um, what, what is the feedback we've been getting from our staff regarding that, if you don't mind uh, just giving us a, a brief overview. Thank you. So the, the PD that I was sharing is specific. I think I wanted to note that it's specific for DLI, right? So we have the ongoing PD that we have for just at the district level, meaning for all of our teachers, and then we have specific ones for DLI. So um, I think I, I really highlighted three as far as overarching DLI, but um, we've been very responsive. I've been meeting with teachers quite a bit in the sense of some of them feel more comfortable meeting one-on-one -on -one or have very specific questions. So the response has been um, great in the sense of, they're, we're able to be responsive in meeting individually, or we're also adding, like I, 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 you heard me mention, we added two just today because of the response that they actually want more. So um, it's not always the case, but they are asking to um, be trained in more. Okay, I just wanna make sure that our uh, staff is feeling supported as far as the PD that they're able to access. It sounds like that's the case. Yes, and we're also offering at different times as well, different um, more than once. So let's say they can meet it at this time. We've added multiple opportunities for them to access even the same PD or individualized. All right. Any other questions, board members? All right. Great work, everyone. Let's go ahead and move on to item 7B. AESD COVID-19 preparedness. This will be presented by Dr. For Christopher Downing, our superintendent, Michael Krauss, our assistant superintendent of administrative services, and our director of risk management, Tracy Golden. All right, thank you, board president. I will uh, load up the presentation now. Okay. All right. So we will begin. And uh, I thought we would start by sharing with you some of the COVID data uh, of Anaheim. And as you can see from this graphic, uh, we list the five zip codes of Anaheim. And within the map are the number of total cases within a zip code. 
So um, as you can see, the darker the shading, the more cases that there are. I'll give you a chance. Uh, next, this is a case history by zip code over the last uh, 14 days. And the green represents the total number of cases and the blue lines represent new cases within the last 14 days. As you can see, there's still that staircase effect uh, going up, which means the total number of cases are growing. But as you can see from the blue line, there's been a fluctuation uh, in terms of there are specific days where the numbers will spike and then we might see a decline. But then uh, in most cases, we see growth again. Uh, this third graphic, uh, we provided it for you because it dispels a common myth. And that miscommunication that's going around is that children uh, do not contract COVID-19. So what we wanted to show for you uh, on the right, you have our zip codes and the number of positive cases of children between the ages of zero and 17. On the left, it shows Anaheim in comparison to other cities. So as you can see, Anaheim and Santa Ana are considered hot spots because of the high number of cases that we have for children. Continuing, uh, this graphic again shows you a 14 day case rate. And if you look in the middle row, you'll see new cases and you'll see that in 92801, there were 257, 92802, 185, 92804, 251, 92805, 294, and 92806, 122. So over the last 14 days, there were 1,109 new cases of COVID. This graphic is also important because at the, on the bottom row, it talks about the rate of new cases per 100,000 residents or population. The number that, and I'll show a graphic in a moment, that the county will be operating under, as you're aware, we're on a watch list, is there needs to be less than 100 cases per 100,000 residents. But as you can see here in Anaheim, the numbers are quite high and they range between 270 all the way up to 416 per 100,000 residents. Another number that's important is that when residents are tested, we're looking for a positivity rate below 8%. And as you can see, overall in Orange County, the positivity rate is at 7.7% as of August 12th. However, when you look at Santa Ana and Anaheim, you see quite a different story. So you see in Anaheim, the positivity rate is 19.1%. And again, this graphic uh, just illustrates what data must be present for our county to exit the watch list. So confirmed or probable cases must be below 100 per 100,000 residents and positive test rates below 8% for 14 consecutive days. It was important to include this slide because as you can see, um, although Orange County has had overall uh, ongoing decline and the county as a whole are nearing these numbers so that we the county might possibly exit the watch list the story of the data in anaheim is quite different and although there has been a recent decline as i said uh, and as you saw for some of our zip codes we're above 400 per 100,000 residents which is four times the threshold that is required for us to return to blended learning or have students return to in-person learning in our district.
So board members, at this time, we wanted to share with you some of the health and safety procedures that we have put in place uh, to support our students, our families, and our staff during COVID-19. And I am going to introduce Tracy Golden, who is our Director of Risk Management, and Tracy is also serving as our COVID-19 coordinator. Tracy. Good evening, everyone. Um, happy to be here and talk about this. Um, I wanted to start with just an overview of how we are coordinating our response. Um, our district response is really anchored in our reopening plan. Um, we are following the guidance of the you know, government health agencies, uh, particularly the California Department of Public Health. And we are also collaborating with the um, Orange County Healthcare Agency. As you know, um, you know, guidelines are often changing and uh, they're very fluid. So we're making sure that we're keeping our plan up to date and we revise it as needed uh, so that we have the most current information available in our plan. Um, and another thing that our district has done is, as Dr. Downing uh, mentioned, we have um, a point person for COVID-19 so that all information can be gathered into one place and then kind of routed to the appropriate people in the um, district. So uh, that's, that's me and I'm uh, serving as that coordinator and kind of the, the person that um, is uh, coordinating all the responses throughout the district. Next slide. Okay, also to start off, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we uh, get out as uh, much information uh, to both our students and our employees. And so we do have an education um, program right around COVID-19. Uh, the students, when they return back to school, so when they're back to in-person learning, um, have a uh, presentation that's going to be given by their own school nurse about uh, Age appropriate information about how to be safe and you know how school is going to look a little bit different and things that they can do to help uh, keep themselves safe and their their uh, fellow students safe. For our employees, uh, very similar information, uh, but again at an adult level about COVID nineteen, um, how you can keep yourself safe, some of the symptoms that you might see, uh, a lot of resources of where you can go to get really good information. Uh, we also have leave options for any employees that are interested in that and who they can talk to in HR if they have any questions. Um, and so all employees were assigned to this education piece uh, actually in the last two weeks. Um, and I think all of you probably have seen it too. <laughs> okay. So one of the first um, things that you're really going to notice when you come to any school or any district building really is our screening process. This process is for any person that's coming on campus. So it can be students, uh, parents, um, visitors, all our staff members, and it includes a, a symptom checker. So we're checking to um, ask some questions about symptoms and we're also taking temperatures. We've also uh, provided our staff members, all our staff members with the proper protective equipment for themselves the ones who are screening so that they can stay uh, safe also. And so you can see here um, the students and uh, staff coming into school on the first day. Um, another piece of our program is uh, really emphasizing social distancing. Uh, you know, staying six feet apart is not something that's really natural for a lot of us. And so it's been, um, you know, we've had to really be diligent in reminding ourselves and reminding each other how, um, to stay apart from each other, but still conduct business. And one of the things that we've been um, really focusing on is how can we provide those essential services, but also be safe. And so we've really had to find new ways to conduct our business. Uh, the grab and goes are a really good example of something that's come out of that. Uh, being able to provide meals, uh, technology, uh, school supplies for our families while still doing it in a safe manner. And you can see, um, in that photo on the right that we've uh, set up stations and you know people stay in their cars and it's all very safe and all the equipment, protective equipment is available for our uh, employees so they stay safe. Also along uh, social distancing is a lot of physical reminders. We have a lot of signage around all our buildings. We have uh, sandwich boards that are in our walkways. We have decals on the ground to remind us to stay six feet apart. 
Um, we've also arranged all the furniture in our classrooms and our workspaces to ensure that everyone is six feet apart. So we're making sure that we are doing everything possible to keep um, everyone outside of what the CDC calls close contact. We are also requiring uh, face coverings for everybody on our uh, property. And, you know, everybody is doing a really, really good job of that. Uh, reports from schools are that people are showing up with face coverings. And you can see here, uh, picking up technology or school supplies. Um, I did note that these are family members in case anyone is wondering why they're not six feet apart. Um, but uh, otherwise, that they're, they're being really safe and it's going pretty smoothly out there um, with the face coverings and, and the six feet requirement. Tracy, real quick, I have a question with regards to face coverings. Sure. Have you seen anywhere in the research with regards to face coverings and dental issues? Oh, no. You mean, ha mean, you mean having dental issues from the face coverings? Yes. Oh, I have not. Thank you. But I haven't looked either, so I could look into that. <laughs> okay. Um, next slide, Chris. And then, so I just wanted to kind of finish with, with this slide in that, you know, really, I mean, how amazing is our staff and community? Um, you know, these are unprecedented times and it's really difficult to navigate this um, reality that's so drastically different than what we are, are used to. But uh, AESD is uh, rising to the challenge and we're gonna do it with, uh, you know, spirit and style like we always do. So um, that concludes my portion of it. Um, the next slide, uh, I'm going to pass this on to Michael Kraus, who's going to talk about, uh, facilities. All right, Michael. Hi, good evening. Thank you, Tracy. And good evening, everyone. So I am proud to say to you tonight that our district has been very proactive and will continue to be proactive in ensuring the safety of our staff, students, and community. And so what does that look like? So this slide demonstrates the personal protective equipment or PPE as you might have heard and supplies that we are providing. So for instance, on the table in the photo there, you can see non-contact infrared thermometers. Those are the thermometers you hold back from the forehead and they take a temperature reading without having to touch the forehead. Uh, we're also providing face coverings of various ones you can see on the table there. We have cloth face coverings, surgical face coverings, uh, various other ones uh, for our staff and students. We also provide hand sanitizer in the little bottles, the 16 ounce bottles, but we also have the hand sanitizer dispensers at all school sites on the walls that our custodians ensure are continuously filled up if they are empty. We also provide face shields to staff as you've seen in a prior slide that Tracy presented when they were checking in the children on the first day of school, the people doing the checking had a clear face shield that uh, protected their face as well. We also provide gloves to staff. So the in the event that they uh, wanna wear gloves there, they have uh, various um, sizes of gloves. So we've ensured that we have medium, large, extra large, small for our staff. We also provide gowns if they're needed. So for instance, if one of our staff members wishes to wear a gown, we have gowns in the warehouse. We also provide soap that we've continuously supplied for a long time and then alcohol wipes. So what they're used for is to clean the uh, non-contact infrared thermometers after so many uses. So just to give you an idea of the uh, protect, personal protective equipment and supplies that the district has, be, has been and will continue to provide uh, to staff. Next slide, please. So now what do we do when it comes to cleaning and sanitizing? So this has always been a, a question that I get almost weekly. How do we do that and what do we do? So one of the things we do is we use the Environmental Protection Agency approved disinfectants and they are used daily by our staff and they clean very high touch areas, uh, key, keyboards, doorknobs, light switches, things like that. Uh, so they're disinfected and sanitized daily. Staff have been trained on the proper use of these uh, uh, equipment as you can see in the lower right there that is what we call an electrostatic sprayer so you put a liquid in there and you turn it on and it actually takes a spray and you can do a whole room in about five minutes and the particles actually stick to everything in the room without damaging it so wherever you spray it you just have to really spray it in the air for the most part and it really disinfects uh, the entire room using a EPA provided disinfectant. So we've been doing that on a daily basis as well. To the left, you see the cavi wipes. So cavi wipes are used to disinfect non-porous surfaces such as desktops, 
doors, handles, things like that. Uh, and it's a very uh, strong EPA approved disinfectant to be used uh, for disinfecting. So uh, staff and sites have been provided with those cavity wipes as well. Next slide. So here's just some uh, examples of the personal protective equipment. If you see on the gloves for district staff, we have many, many cases in our warehouse and we continue to keep a supply in our warehouse. That's one of the things we've been very proactive in doing is ensuring a continuous supply of PPE equipment. Uh, in the middle there, you see face shields for district staff. We have several cases and continue to uh, receive cases of face shields. We've also set up the temp check stations. And so the supplies for them include the face shields, gloves, uh, masks, the uh, non-contact thermometers, alcohol wipes, hand sanitizer. So we continuously uh, resupply those uh, temp check stations that all district sites have been provided with. And many sites have two and sometimes three of these temp check stations with the supplies on them so that they can uh, check the students in swiftly and the staff. Next slide, please. So here's our warehouse purchasing staff in action. So you can see there, they're looking at the merchandise as it comes in because we wanna make sure that we've ordered the right product to be able to dispense to the sites. And so you see disposable masks, the disinfecting wipes I referred to earlier, and then the little bottles of hand sanitizer that we also give out to staff uh, for their use as well. Next slide, please. So what the facilities department has been doing is uh, ensuring that communal spaces are not shared among staff. So this includes lounges, places where people gather, and this is based on the guidelines provided to us by the California Department of Public Health and other agencies. And so we wanna make sure that there's not shared microwaves, refrigerators, lounges, things like that. So we assessed all of our facilities. And then on the right, you will see a classroom layout. So not just estimating where the desk would go. We actually did an analysis of a classroom to determine the best placement of those desks, including the teacher desk for that. So there's a lot of background work that may not always be out there, but that goes on behind the scenes to ensure that we are providing the safest environment we can for our staff and our students. Next slide, please. So here are some pictures of our maintenance and operations department in action. On the left side, you see them installing plexiglass sneeze guards throughout the district. So the sneeze guards are made of plexiglass and they are either hanging or in the middle picture, you can see where they are sitting stationary on a countertop and they are secured down on the countertop uh, to where you have to really, really push them in order for them to even budge a little bit. So we secure them to ensure the safety of the staff, but we've been putting those in the district. And as you can see in the middle, if you look at that picture, we put a little uh, uh, saying on there, letting people know that it's for the protection of families and staff. And we put it in Spanish as well. And so that's one of the things that we've done so that they understand why is there plexiglass everywhere? Because it's new for a lot of our staff and our students when they came back to see that. And then on the left side, uh, far right side, pardon me, you see uh, temp check carts. So we've taken carts that we've ordered and we assemble them. And then we have our warehouse staff put on all of the supplies needed to uh, check staff and students in. So there's a little bit of M&O in action. Next slide, please. So our transportation department. So currently we are transporting, we have 14 routes uh, providing support to the students that come to the uh, YMCA child care program at our school sites. And as you can see there, we disinfect our buses using the electrostatic sprayers. You can see the uh, sprayer in action there on the far left. We also have social distancing signage for seating. So students don't have to guess, where do I sit? The sign lets them know if they sit there or don't sit there. And then on the far right, you can see as a student enters the bus, we have uh, CDC signs in all school buses that talk about proper hand washing procedures, social distancing, and how to wear a face covering. So every bus has the, those posters installed as well. So we wanna ensure that we continuously remind our students of best practices. So wherever they go, uh, they are doing the best they can to socially distance and wear their face coverings. Uh, next slide. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Downing. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, uh, board members. Uh, we welcome any questions that you might have at this time. All right, board members. Do we have any questions at this time? I do. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Philbeck. Um, well, first, a comment to Dr. Downing, just to back you up on your data and uh, what you were telling us about children definitely are, you know, the, a group that can get COVID and have COVID. I uh, had, was at a, was participated in a webinar and it was Chalk Hospital and they have had, this was as of a few weeks ago, 900 positive cases 
of children. And out of that 900, 100 were requiring in-hospital care. I think about 24, 25, even ICU. So to back you up on that, it absolutely, if people think that children don't get COVID, they're wrong. So, um, and I have just a couple of questions. Michael, I'll start with you because I think this is an easy one. But first of all, I'd like to say that was an absolutely exceptional presentation that just covered it all. And thank you so much. You just, you threw in there. I know I had requested this at the last meeting, but you threw in so much more um, and just made it an exceptional presentation. So thank you. And Michael, my question to you is, I think this will be an easy one. Do you ever see or anticipate us having a problem ensuring continuous supply? Mm, good question. That's, that is a great question. And to answer it, one of the things that we've been doing, and, and you may be aware that we've received some COVID-19 funding from the federal government, and that'll be in a uh, board meeting coming up on how much money and, and what we're doing with that. But one of the things we're able to do with that is buy PPE equipment. So what we're doing is being very proactive and not just buying it month to month. In order to ensure that we have a continuous pipeline, we are actually buying a minimum of 12 months worth of items such as face coverings, such as uh, hand sanitizer. We've estimated uh, by the month how much we would need each month. If we're actually able to buy a full year's worth and keep it in the warehouse in a cool location where it's still good uh, for many years until we need it. So we're being very proactive because we know as people start going back to work and back to school, uh, the pipeline will get uh, thinner and thinner. So we want to be proactive and ensure that we had a continuous uh, supply in our warehouse. And Michael, if I could just add, uh, we've additionally received some PPEs from the Orange County Department of Education who received them from the state of California. So those materials are also being shared with our schools. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. And then for Tracy, um, I'm, I'm curious about the, Tracy still, still with us? Yeah. Okay. Tracy, you, I hope you can answer this. When we get back into a blended form and we're up, we have children on campuses, when the children go to the nurse's station because they're ill and that child is in there, my question is basically not knowing if, it's, if it could be a COVID exposure or not. Um, you know, you got to wait for the parents to come and, and pick them up. So that child's going to be in there in a while. <coughs> so kind of a twofold question here. When that child leaves, what's the process or protocol that we're putting in place to then re sort of sterilize that nurse's office? What mm -hmm. happens? Does it, is it come in and everything is sprayed again or what? And also, if two children get sick at the same time, is one held back? Is one, um, if you could just explain a little bit about the actual sort of nursing uh, office situation here. Sure. So actually what we've done is every school has identified a sick room um, and we're really trying not to use the nurse's office because that's that's where the medications are kept and that's where we're seeing yes, other kids exactly. maybe like, you know, got a cut on their finger, a PE, a recess, whatever. So we've identified an area the principals have at their school site that's kind of being used for what we're calling a sick room. Um, and that'll be a place that can uh, kind of serve as an isolation place for anybody that is sick has symptoms while they wait for you know someone to come up. Um, and then to go to your question about what happens after. So let's say the student gets picked up and we, you know, talk to the parents about what's going on and recommend that they really, you know, uh, consult with their uh, healthcare provider, then we do contact MNO right away and they do a, a deep disinfectant of that room before anybody else is allowed in there. And okay. so that's kind of the overall process of it. Um, now, to, to answer your question about whether there's more than one, then we're going to have to find another room for that. Um, and, um, you know, we're going to hope that there's not more than four or five in one, in one day. But there is a disinfecting process, and there has been identified already at schools where their sick room is going to be. Okay, thank you so much, and thanks for the presentation. It's really informative. Thank you. Good. Board members, I'm going to go ahead and ask the next question. Uh, thank you, Trustee Philbeck. Uh, so you're right. There is a lot of misinformation out there that is hurtful to our communities. And I just wanted to clarify, uh, and great job, Dr. 
uh, Tracy Golden, Dr. Downing, uh, Michael, great work, very thorough. Uh, you know, right now, number one thing is keeping all of our staff, our students, and our families and communities safe during this time, given the data, right? And I just wanted to verify that this data is data from, how do you say it, uh, epidemiologists, right? People who dedicate their entire lives to studying pandemics, right? From UC Irvine, right? Our, our University of Irvine, University of California at Irvine, the most recent, the closest university to uh, Anaheim. Is that correct? That is correct. So our data is a combination and actually any persons who are watching tonight's board meeting can go to the Orange County Healthcare Agency website as well. They've created a dashboard. And um, I would ask that you really look at the zip code data and look at the differences between Anaheim, Santa Ana, and other cities in Orange County while you're visiting their website. Thank you so much, Dr. Downing. Yes, members of the public definitely listen to uh, the experts at this. There is a lot of misinformation out there. In fact, last week I read a crazy article in the LA Times, someone, not gonna name who, claiming that you know this uh, you know, face masks create dental issues. But if you look at Dr. Shruti Gohil, and if you don't mind, Tracy, I'd love for you to continue to do this research to make sure it's accuracy, who's an associate and medical director of epidemiology and in infectious prevention at UC Irvine also said that if masks cause dental issues, then surgeons and other medical professionals would have higher incidences of them because they wear masks daily for a prolonged period of times. So I think that is very important that we are careful with regards to our misinformation because our families' lives are at risk. So I, I just, you know, I just want the public to know that. Thank you. Um, Any other board members questions at this time? Dr. McCullough, could I quickly say, uh, you mentioned UC Irvine, and they've been outstanding in terms of working with our district as well as the other neighboring districts here in Anaheim to provide us with ongoing data and support in terms of um, what we should expect from COVID-19, some of the data trends, and just offering their professional uh, advice and counsel during this time. Thank you very much, Dr. Downing. Board members, any other questions related to this uh, presentation? I have something to add, if I may. Uh, definitely. Okay, um, yeah, so thank you so much for that comprehensive plan. It makes me feel uh, good that we've thought, basically thought of everything, right? And I think it comes uh, to a lot of credit that we had a lot of stakeholder input as we were developing these plans and everybody kind of thought through everything that might present itself. Uh, I'm a little concerned because um, even though if we return with all these precautions, there's still gonna be cases of co uh, contamination within our schools and our families and our employees. And uh, I guess my comment, uh, maybe Dr. Downing can address, um, if the state gets to the point where they say, yeah, or if the county says, yeah, Orange County schools are ready to go, and if our numbers get to the point where they go under the threshold that you mentioned earlier, is there a possibility that we as a board could decide, well, maybe we're not gonna do the hybrid model and wait till it's completely safe and go back uh, <clears throat> to the full scale model? Uh, because my worry is that even though we're, we're taking every single precaution where we're, we're providing every safety measure possible and we have the best interest of our community at heart that going back even when the threshold is lower than what it, we're, we're expecting, we're still going to be causing cases to spread in Anaheim. So is there a possibility, I don't, I'm not sure um, what the legalities of it would be, of could a district decide, even though under the threshold, we're gonna prolong the distance learning a little longer? Um, based on the information that we've received, um, our district could, take into account uh, the data within Anaheim and we would have to work with uh, Dr. Chow and the Orange County uh, Healthcare Agency. Uh, the issue and the immediate issue that we're facing, and I alluded to it earlier, is that the data in Orange County is reaching that threshold, whereas the data in Anaheim is nowhere near that threshold, or, as well as Santa Ana. So I think um, we 
continue to engage with uh, Dr. Chow and the Orange County Healthcare Agency. Uh, he understands the differentiation that's happening amongst zip codes as well as cities. And I feel strongly that, uh, you know, as a board, uh, we would be able to take the appropriate uh, measures to protect our students um, should that eventuality arise. Thank you so Thank much. You. All right, board members, any other questions? Trustee Lopez? Yeah, Dr. McGullis, yeah, I have, a, uh, I have a comment, not really a question, just I wanted to thank the staff for putting this together and keeping us um, aware of what's going on in our community and making sure that the public is aware, that our families are aware. And uh, you brought up a good point with the um, relying on our experts uh, rather than hearsay. Uh, I call it fortuitous timing, but uh, I did just call my dentist on Monday uh, to schedule my six-month cleaning. And uh, while I had them on the phone, I, I asked them uh, what their opinion was on that. And they gave me, they had never heard of any dental issues being caused by the wearing of masks. So nobody in the office had ever heard of that. So, um, and they said the same thing, essentially, that for a prolonged period of time, they would have all had been exposed to COVID. So ah. and it didn't happen. So uh, I just okay. want to echo that sentiment as well. So thank you for pointing that out. Thank you, Trustee Lopez, and I hope that you uh, have a good dental experience. <laughs> Board President, could I say one more thing? Of course. Yeah. Um, I just like to take a moment to recognize all of our staff members, um, those who have been, you know, reporting in person. Um, so often, uh, it goes unnoticed that educators are also, you know, on the front line as much as possible, uh, supporting. Um, again, uh, those students that are coming for daycare and operating our offices so that we're available to answer the calls of parents and um, all of our m &O staff and our gardeners and our bus drivers and all of our staff members who are here uh, keeping us amazing through this difficult time. And, you know, we don't say it enough, but um, thank you to all of you that might be out there listening. We appreciate you. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. And of course, thank you thank to you. our yes. teachers uh, for our uh, distance learning 3.0 um, and helping us uh, continue to provide high quality instruction during this difficult time. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Trustee Ruelas. Uh, yes. So first off, thank you, Mr. Lopez, for that comment about the whole issue of, you know, my teeth being okay. My parents spent a lot of money on braces growing up, and I don't want to jack that up now, you know. Uh, but uh, in reality, though, my question is about, like, front office staff and in regards to the type of PD or um, protocols and whatnot that they've received, you know. Um, Obviously, yes, of course, the, the students and whatnot are our number one concern. And I think we're doing a great job with that with our distance learning. And, you know, shout out to all the teachers and, and all of our staff members for really working hard. But what about in regards to our, our, our front office personnel? Because I imagine people are still going to be going to the school sites on a regular basis. Um, I imagine the situation as a whole is completely foreign to everybody and, and dealing with people. And, you know, I, I, I bring this up just because of the fact that you know, I sit on the board of trustees, you know, and I went to our district and I had to wait five, like more like five to seven minutes outside the main building for someone so I can come in and sign a resolution that no one ever came out and addressed me, you know, and I'm a board member. So I, I just think to myself, I wonder how it works with other parents and whatnot. And I want to make sure that we're giving them the appropriate customer service that they deserve. Yeah, I'll, I'll start and then I'll ask Tracy to join in. So um, one group that I didn't recognize, of course, is our administrators who are there and supporting our schools. Uh, we've trained our staff with uh, screening protocols. And I want to thank our administrators for embracing these protocols and implementing them at every school site. So in terms of our office staffs, uh, they are now uh, back. Um, the office staffs are in place. Uh, we do have protocols for visitors. Uh, we ask that you be screened, that you wear a mask, and that, uh, again, uh, we haven't had any concerns expressed 
uh, from families who are visiting. Um, um, you know, as we have come closer to the school start, we have brought back more staff. Uh, as you may be aware, uh, data was truly spiking this summer. And in an abundance of caution, we did have some of our staff working remotely, but still getting their job done. Um, in terms of our schools, uh, we ask whenever possible that parents uh, do, you know, notify the school that you're coming up so the appropriate precautions can be taken. And um, I think, you know, uh, we are being supportive of the community. All right, wonderful. Uh, thank you for that response. Board members, any more questions? Tracy, was there anything you wanted to add regarding our protocols or did I? Um, well, I just wanted to maybe add that, um, you know, I, the administrators um, have really communicated to their families so that they know that, you know, we really, uh, you know, prefer an appointment because as many of you know, you've probably been in some of those schools that have really small front offices and we don't want to congregate. Um, so they've been proactive in like communicating um, you know, it's harder for us at the district office because maybe the public is coming and they don't don't know, but the schools have communicated that to their families. But I have heard from administrators that, you know, of course, some people do just come by and they've, you know, gone out there and talked to them and tried to keep everybody at their six foot distance. And, and everybody's been really understanding in the sense that they know, you know, this is for the safety of everyone. So I I, um, I think it's, it's going well at the school sites. I haven't heard otherwise, but um, I think that we are, the, Principals are being very um, uh, proactive in, in serving our families. Okay, so the systems and everything at the school sites are set up and yeah. not bumpy. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. All right, board members, any other questions for uh, Tracy, Dr. Downing, or Michael? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and move on to eight. Consent calendar, items listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and are acted on by the board in one motion. There's no discussion of these items unless a member of the board, staff or the public request specific items to be discussed and or removed from the consent calendar. So board members at this time, would you like to pull any items from our consent calendar? All right, hearing none, then it is recommended the Board of Education approve or ratify the following consent calendar items. Can I get a motion? So moved. So moved. Go back. So, so moved. Second, Ruelas. Uh, seconded by Trustee Ruelas. Discussion? Hearing none, let's go ahead and do a roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas? Aye. Trustee Philbeck? Aye. Trustee Lopez? Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I vote aye, passes 5-0. Moving on to our action calendar. 9A, Superintendent's Office, there is none. 9B, Ed Services, it is recommended the Board of Education approve resolution number 2020-21 slash 03, instructional materials and officially certify that pupils in the school will have during the 2020 2021 school year, sufficient textbooks and or instructional materials consistent with the con content and cycle of the curriculum frameworks adopted by the California Department of Education. That's Ed Code 60119. A public hearing for this item was held on, I mean, at the July 22, 2020 board meeting. Can I get a motion? So moved, Alvarez. Second. So moved by Trustee Alvarez. Can I get a second? Seconded by Trustee Ruelas. <clears throat> discussion I have a clarifying question about this um since we're all virtual now it, it, it is it is the whole how I like how do we figure that out with the Williams Act and everything like that is it is it a hard copy of the textbook or is it a combination of both electronic copy of the textbook and hard copy how does this work here um they have not confirmed with us that yet we are going through the motions of turning in the paperwork, but when I ask them, you know, what, do you, what, what, what will we show you to show we have sufficient materials? Um, mm -hmm. The county wasn't sure yet. <laughs> okay. What, what about with consumables, uh, Dr. Grace? 
Oh, thank you for asking. Um, it, in addition to our all of our curriculum being digital, so our students have digital access, our teachers have digital access, all of the student materials at the school site for our English language arts and our math program and the social studies we just adopted are consumable. Okay. So we are able to send home materials. We sent home, there's two books for math. We sent home the first edition and we also sent home the first 12 weeks of consumables for English language arts. Wonderful. And even before COVID, these consumables don't come back, right? That's where the students can fill up and then they keep. Good. Yes, correct. Yes, correct. Good. Okay, good. Board members, any other questions with regards to this? Uh, uh, or, I mean, uh, anything else to discuss with regards to this? All right, hearing none, let's go ahead and do a roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck? Aye. Trustee Lopez? Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez? Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5 0. Moving on to B2. It is recommended the Board of Education adopt resolution number 2020 21 04, declaring the month of September as Attendance Awareness Month. Can I get a motion? So moved. Relis. So moved by Trustee Ruelas. Can I get a second? Second, Philbeck. Seconded by Trustee Philbeck. Discussion. All right. Hearing none, roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Our board clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Moving on to C. SELPA, there is none. D, human resources. It is recommended, the Board of Education, approve the appointment of employee number 0819-2020-01. Two, the position of vice principal, effective August 20, 2020. This individual be, will be assigned to Loera Elementary School. Can I get so a motion? Relis. So moved by Trustee Ruelas. Can I get a second? Second, Lopez. Seconded by Trustee Lopez. Discussion. Hearing none, board roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Dina. Please help us welcome Melissa Meyer to the Vice Principal position at Loera School. Melissa joined AESD in 2019 as the TOSA PD at Jefferson School. Before coming to AESD, she spent 11 years serving districts as an assistant principal, first grade teacher, and high school Spanish teacher. Melissa will begin her vice principal position at Loera tomorrow. Congratulations, Melissa. Congratulations. Moving on to E, administrative services, there are none. So moving on to my favorite part of the evening, our board discussion, item 10. Board members' activities related to school business. Let's go ahead and begin with Trustee Ruelas. Thank you, Dr. McGoss. Uh, not much to report this time around. Um, like uh, many of my colleagues in Anaheim Elementary School District, I've been getting myself ready to jump into the exciting world of virtual teaching. Um, but I have had some um, conversations with parents and whatnot. I want to give a shout out to Dr. Grace. Uh, I received a couple panic phone calls from parents in the community about why they couldn't log on and they were having a difficult time and just one text. Dr. Grace sent me one text and I sent that out. Boom, problem solved. Thank you, Dr. Grace. Um, I also um, just want to give a shout out to all the teachers out there. Um, it's been fantastic um, looking and, and seeing your energy and your excitement as you were about to embark on this new um, reality we all face in virtual learning. And, um, you know, I, I myself have jumped on board with that as well, um, making my Bitmoji and everything. And, uh, you know, it's just been awesome. Um, 
trustee Alvarez can testify. I called him frantic one day about how can I do this? You know, uh, really frantic about it. So these are the things that are keeping me up at night. Um, but it's great because of the fact that the teachers in AESD, super talented. I just want to give a shout out to all of them for all the hard work that they're doing. I know this is tough, but please know that everything that you're doing is just fantastic. And our kids are excited to be back in school, even if it's virtually. And we're just really proud of all the, 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 the things that you're doing to make lessons engaging and innovative, as well as all the other actions done um, from our classified members as well to show their support. And um, I'm just very uh, com confident and comfortable um, in regards to how we're approaching everything uh, thus far here in AESD and our awesome virtual learning. So that concludes my report. Thank you, Trustee Ruelas. Trustee Philbeck. Thank you. Um, and again, uh, I'd also like to say, um, piggybacking onto that, thank you to all of our staff, teachers and classified and everyone and cabinet and everybody that's been working to get us off the ground here and in going and in this new normal that we're experiencing. And it's, it's a lot of work. It's a tremendous amount of work, but pulling together and working together, I, I, I it's, it's going to happen. And so thank you to everyone that has put that effort forward to um, to do this, to keep us together and to, and to put us into this new phase and format. Um, I would like to just talk about a couple of webinars. I've been listening to this webinar series uh, called Thinking About Tomorrow. Um, and it's coming to me through actually um, through a consultant of First Five. And one of the first ones I listened to was uh, children's mental health during COVID. And the presenters, these are some pretty awesome presenters. It was um, Dr. Heather Husty, for, who's the chief psychologist for Chalk Hospital, and Kim Gall, who is the president and CEO of First Five of Orange County. So regarding children's mental health, it's just something I want to call out because it's something we should all be worried about. And more importantly, we, we need to be able to address it in the near future. It's going to be something impacting us when our kids come back to traditional school. It's, it's hard for the children to process all that's happening. Um, there's a lot that's being seen especially in their own family situations because of the quarantining and the circumstances that are going on, it's pretty much impossible for children not to absorb what is happening and some of the negativity around that. So I just want to say, you know, this, I learned a lot and I just want us to be ready for this issue um, because I think it's going to be very relevant. Um, also, there was another webinar and I'll bring this up because maybe I noticed this as the woman on the board, but the presentation was um, the Orange County perinatal mental health, also known as postpartum depression. I noticed a lot of new moms in our districts everywhere. We, we have a lot of new mothers. This is something that I learned, and I have known some in the district, even I've heard about that, have experienced this. And it can get so severe, I, don't, I did not know this, that mothers can hallucinate. Um, and it's considered postpartum depression for up to a year. Just mentioning it because circumstances are also contributing to make this worse now and harder to diagnose and refer mothers to proper resources. So I'm just thinking that, you know, now that I understand it a little bit more and all the opportunities that we have or will have eventually to interact with through our own, own programs, for us to just be more aware and be able to refer those to resources that need it. Um, because uh, look around, there's, there's lots of new babies happily that are that are born in this district uh also the virtual town hall on the aesd youtube channel thank you dr downing i thought you did an absolutely great job um and i hope that we have these we have more of these and regular um and one other webinar which was back to school in the time of covid and I already mentioned a little bit, it was the presenters were the uh, chalk uh, vice president of patient care and chief nurse 
officer and Dr. Charles Golden, who is the VP and Executive Medical Director of Primary Care for Chalks Children Hospital. And I already mentioned the it was basically about children get COVID too, but also that uh, one of the things they considered most important to curb the spread and slow the spread, even for children, the number one thing, masks. It was masks. So uh, other than that, uh, last night I participated in a community forum with Dr. Moreno, focusing on the community needs. And I was able to offer some suggestions from our district so thank you, Dr. Downing, and also some specific ones from Wendy Dolan, who, if you know, is connected with Network Anaheim, but she also directs and oversees our McKinney Bento program. So uh, I'd like to just give a shout out to her uh, and all the work that she and Rosa Fisher are doing. Rosa is also involved with that program, and she's our district homeless liaison. So thank you to them both. And... Tomorrow, I'm going to be watching another webinar. This one is different. Sports are back. But the reason I'm interested is because there's going to be uh, OC Soccer Club, Angel Stadium, and Ducks. And for everybody's knowledge here, we have a lot of people in this district that work in those areas, that work even part-time for the stadium, especially in the um, Honda Center. So it'll be interesting to hear what they have to say about what the plans are to getting people back to work and thank you for listening and that concludes my report thank you trustee philbeck all right trustee lopez thank you president Magalis. um i i also have to agree with uh our colleague mr relis i'm a new uh bitmoji convert uh just got my whole bitmoji set up i didn't have any idea how to do that two weeks ago and I wouldn't say I'm an expert now either, but um, I'm, I'm kind of getting there just, just day by day. Um, and uh, so with that, I also just want to just extend my appreciation for our staff as well, because it's challenging at the high school and junior high level uh, interacting with uh, a lot of our, our students. So I could only imagine uh, the elementary school level, getting the kids engaged, getting our students uh, to really uh, be a part of the class and not just walk away from the computer. Um, so I really want to uh, uh, extend my appreciation for that. Um, I was able to attend a couple of things uh, that were kind of touched on briefly already. So we will spend a lot of time on it. But uh, the first one was uh, August 3rd. We had our new certified, uh, cert certificated and classified uh, employee orientation. So I was able to participate in that at the beginning um, and kind of do a quick welcome. Um, I couldn't see anybody, but I was I was glad to be able to meet them uh, virtually, and hopefully uh, one of these days we can meet in person. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, and the second thing was uh, the virtual town hall. I just want to thank Dr. Downing and the cabinet and the staff for putting that together, and the uh, tech gurus uh, for being able to to get that online and making it available for the, our parents and families who could not attend it at that time, uh, but to be able to to listen and watch it. Uh, at a different time uh, the following day. So uh, with that, I will conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Lopez. <clears throat> Board Clerk Alvarez. Hi, uh, okay, so uh, beginning of the month, I was actually able to partake in some of the uh, training that was given to our teachers. Uh, so I uh, visited the Microsoft Teams uh, meeting where the, the teachers were learning the new uh, learning management system. I want to give a shout out to Christina and Corey for doing such a great job in putting that together. The amount of patience and care that our presenters gave to our teachers was just exemplary and very professional. And um, what, what was really kind of cool to see is the, the hunger for our teachers to want to learn. Those uh, rooms were at capacity, 250 people per session, and they were full. And so I was lucky enough to get in there early enough to, to get in before there was, it was capacity. But um, I learned a lot about the learning management system and how it works, uh, which is helpful to understand because I feel like we need to know what our teachers are using. And then I also visited the Pear Deck presentation at 2 p.m., a uh, wonderful uh, presentation about how to use Pear Deck to improve instruction and uh, provide more engaging uh, opportunities for our students. So thank you so much for the, uh, uh, the team that put together the professional development calendar. It lasted a whole week. Pretty much the entire day, teachers could jump into a session and learn everything about different platforms and strategies that they could use to enhance the digital 
learning experience for our kids and our families. Super happy to be able to partake in that. And then again, uh, like everyone mentioned, the town hall that Dr. Downing put together um, was phenomenal. And it was just what our families needed to kind of get their questions answered. And it provided a video that they could link to later on YouTube. They couldn't watch it. So a lot of families appreciated that. Um, and I know firsthand that they did. Um, I also want to thank all the teachers and staff for all their investment um, in our families and in the time that they're placing their own personal time to create lessons and create opportunities for our families to connect. Um, and I want to praise everyone for their professionalism on the first day of school. Um, I know there were some hiccups in the morning, but everyone pulled together and uh, made it happen for the first day. Uh, immediately, uh, my son goes to man immediately within a couple of minutes of kind of the system just shutting down. We were receiving phone calls from the school site, um, telling us what to do, where to go. And, and then we were, we were able to, as a parent network, share that with other parents and get them on. So it was uh, definitely a community effort, but a very stressful one. And so I just want to give some perspective as a parent. Um, mostly my wife's dealing with it because at the same time that school is going on, I'm teaching. So um, there's a lot of disconnection happening with the internet, right? There's a lot of uh, issues with uh, not being able to maybe get onto a call for uh, Microsoft Teams. And it's not, it's not that we're not prepared, right? We're offering uh, top-notch learning management systems. We're giving our families hotspots. We provide every student with a laptop, all these great opportunities that we're providing for our families. I'm actually paying like $70 a month for my own personal internet. And because of all the things that are happening, all the devices that are being connected citywide, we're still having glitches, right? And so I just ask everyone for patience. Patience for the teachers, right? Patience for the families, the parents. My wife has to sit at the desk in the kitchen the entire day with my son. It is uh, obviously the best thing for us to engage the kids as much as we can. But also we have to re realize that we have to think about the humanity of it all, right? We don't pressure your teachers to give so much stuff. Don't pressure the families to have to be on there every second. It's almost physically impossible, right? There's gonna be some times where you just lose a connection and it takes you 20 minutes to get it back, right? So um, I'm super proud of our staff and our community and everyone who's moving forward. This is the most difficult, unprecedented times we're living, the most stressful time of my life I could recall, but we're gonna get through it and uh, we got each other and we'll make it happen. So appreciate everybody. Thank you so much. Great words, board clerk Alvarez and all the board members. Um, wow, very powerful. Yes, patience and gratitude. And thank you so much to all of our staff and uh, for all their hard work during these difficult times and to our leadership. Great work. It, literally talk about being proactive, right? When things were glitching given all the preparedness that we had done there was a backup ready and it was effective right so kudos to our leadership kudos to our teachers kudos to our community as we fight this thing together um i'd like to share a couple things um so on july 30th uh i also attended um a training uh this was a virtual conference everything's online I do miss going to conferences with everyone. Uh, this was for the National Association of Multicultural Education, the chapter in California. Uh, and then uh, I also attended the virtual town hall on August 4th. Great job, Dr. Downing. Um, as you all know, I'm also, uh, I also have a new job. I did start it. Uh, I am now a professor at uh, California State University, Los Angeles. And uh, aside from all the multitude of meetings that we've been going to this summer and, and board members, great work. I know y'all have been to a multitude of Zoom meetings, uh, more than you can imagine uh, during our regular summers uh, when we have a little more time for ourselves. But um, part of my time this summer I actually used uh, writing. That's part of my new job. And uh, as of last Monday, I did submit my second publication. This one is actually a book chapter uh, that I co-authored uh, and it will be in the handbook on teaching social issues, the second edition by Ronald Evans. So wish me luck. Uh, I'll find out some feedback in two months and um, yeah. And, and everyone out there be safe, great work. Super proud of everybody. Amazing AESD, ma amazing uh, leadership. 
Um, so with that said, let's move on to item 11, future agenda items. Board members, do we have any future agenda items? Okay, Trustee Wallace. Yes, uh, Dr. McAuliffe, one of the great things that's taken place in this whole, you know, self-quarantine stuff, uh, especially throughout the month is, I'm super proud of, of our parents here mm. in Anaheim yeah. Elementary School District and the leadership roles that they've taken on and the networking that they're doing in the community. And it really makes me proud because they feel strongly that they receive this confidence and, and mm. organizing skills based off of our own um, Parent Leadership Institute. Um, I would love to hear uh, uh, an update from the okay. parents, uh, the Anaheim Elementary School District uh, Parent Leader Institute or the Parent Leaders in Action um, mm -hmm. of all the amazing things that they've been doing because literally every week they're doing something in the district and it's awesome. And they provided me with great opportunities to go participate in community service events, et cetera. And I would just really like for, if possible, if we can have a, a report out on that. Great idea. I second that one, Trustee Ruelas. Board members, anything else you'd like to see on the future agen uh, agenda items? Uh, yes, I would like to, first of all, it's, it's, we're off to a great start. I know there were some glitches, but they were handled and I'm really proud of, of everybody that, um, was working together, you know, and being patient and tolerant. I was wondering if it's possible, and this might already have been considered, uh, some parents have asked me, is it possible when we've been on about three to four weeks, maybe four weeks that we could do a soft survey? Um, with the parents and, and you can include staff too, but especially the parents, uh, and I know we're, we're keeping, we're continually keeping our pulse on this, which taking the pulse on this, which is great, but we might not one size might not fit all. And so based on what is working or where there's some issues, we can maybe offer some uh, adjustment there. But I was wondering if we could just, just a soft survey, nothing, you know, like too um, elaborate, just to kind of mm. see where we're at. And also um, I just maybe, and you can put this in a, in the memo if you want, I'm, Curious about how many of the, for the academy, our, our online academy mm. enrollment, how many are new, new to our district? And if we know that, and how many were already our students? Because I think we have some actual brand new students. So I was curious about that. And are we ever going to have like a um, separate phone number for the academy or, or how, some information on that is it always going to go through you know are we going to eventually like maybe have a separate phone line just for the uh, um for that school okay. like we like we do for the other schools or what will be separate from the actual or kind of you know pulled off of of the district like a regular school and that was it thank you so much thank you trustee philbeck board members anything else you'd like to put on the future agenda items all right. Hearing none, I adjourn this meeting at approximately 8.07 p.m. Our next regular board meeting will be Wednesday, September 9, 2020. Thank you very much, everyone. Be safe out there. Stay home. Wear your mask. Bye, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, Good night everybody. Thank you. Thank you for